Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, I feel like a rock star because I have like two microphones. Um, thank you for being here. We re, re, do you, you can't hear me? OK, who's I? OK, is that, is that good like this? Yeah? All right. And Tim has a better microphone anyway, right? I think to, no, seriously, right? Or, OK. OK, so welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the first event of GMGI's 10th anniversary celebration. So it's incredible to see all of you here. Uh, you, every single person that I recognize, at least, I know has contributed greatly to this effort in all kinds of different ways. And we're very grateful to uh, all of you. Um, 10 years is a long time. And at the same time, it uh, feels like it was yesterday. And I see really good friends sitting over there as well. Thank you to all of you for, for being here. So you know, I think we've, we've accomplished uh, quite a bit. Um, there's still a lot to do, obviously. Uh, but since we thought um, it happens that the 10th anniversary is on the same year than the 400th, uh, um, you know, we should maybe try to match the two uh, to, to, to the extent that we can. So anyway, um, this is a good story. I, th I was asked to start the uh, evening by showing you a short video. And I'm sure many of you uh, have seen it, maybe. But it's so good that you want to see it a second time, right, or a third time. So I need to. The Gloucester Marine Genomics Institute was founded in the belief that the field of genomics, particularly when applied to marine life, represents a new source of opportunity to expand medical and scientific knowledge. We're changing the trajectory of the community, both through bringing science to the community, making new discoveries that will have an impact on fisheries, on human health, and also changing the trajectory of the students we train at the academy. Coming out of the academy, I have more hands-on experience than a lot of my colleagues that did four years in college. It's a small commitment that unlocks life-changing opportunities. What's really exciting about GMGI is the way the technology has progressed. We're on the cutting edge, and that will allow us to answer these really complex and interesting questions. We can find new discoveries that can directly impact human health. We are small, but mighty. You would never know that we are a team of under 30 people when you see the groundbreaking research being conducted in our labs and the transformative education experiences being provided at our academy. And we are just getting started. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I think it's a really beautiful, uh, beautiful piece of work. Actually, it got an award of some kind, right, I think? No, is that the one? Yeah. Um, OK, so um, you know, what have we done? Uh, you've heard a little bit about the research in the video and a little bit about the academy. Most of you know almost uh, you know, what you need to know about both. I'll just remind you that at this point, we have um, more than a dozen researchers there at 417 uh, Maine. Um, we've graduated almost 100, if not more by now, uh, 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 people from the academy whose life has been really changed. I mean, David Walt in the video says that you know, this is about changing trajectories. I think he's really right. I mean, I, you know, right now, today, this afternoon, I was speaking with one of them in my lab at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And I can honestly tell you, he just started last week. He, in my lab, actually, he lives with a person who's sitting right there. Uh, and uh, that's cool. Uh, and he's honestly, and the last one we had was the same thing. They're honestly, at what we do in my lab specifically, they are better than college graduates. I'm serious. You can, there can be some catching up later, of course. I mean, you still should go to college, should, you should go to college if you can, obviously. But, you know, that's where they are. Anyway. So uh, we also have uh, done some really good uh, oops, progress on the research. And um, what I'm here today for is to introduce one of our fantastic researchers. So uh, before I do that, I was asked to give you a little sense of you know, how, we, how we got to this point. Um, for those who haven't heard the stories, 
uh, amazing support from, 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 um, from politicians, from elected individuals, amazing support from so many of you in the community, um, and uh, the building of, of that place where we are right now, we're, we're fortunate to, uh, to be able to occupy these, um, these, uh, this uh, square footage. It's really uh, gorgeous. It was, you know, not maybe the fastest we would have Im imagined, but when you look at it, what's good about where we are, and I'm looking at people who directly help the, the uh, organization at this point, is on the human level, the people we have been able to recruit or who have accepted to you know, provide a big chunk of their time to the goals that we have are really s superb. I mean, I, you know, we've built this thing and I, we think we can really move on now with an amazing human skill basis. Um, as you know, our goals are several. I won't go through them right now. But uh, to talk about tonight's subject, obviously one of the uh, major ideas and challenges, uh, challenges that we wanted to address was to use research, high quality, worldwide recognized research, uh, to try to help informing on any issues that we could help with uh, for the fisheries and, and maybe aquaculture uh, type subjects. So to us, that's not the only thing we do at GMDI on the research front. Uh, Andrea Butnar is sitting there and she'll, she would do a better job at giving you all the details, but we also try to understand how the ocean can, what the living you know, uh, uh, species and ecosystems in the ocean can help us uh, basically solving uh, human problems such as disease, cancer, and, and other things. Um, having said this, this is what connects to today's uh, uh, event. Tim O'Donnell is one of our amazing researchers at GMGI. He's a, uh, his, his title is research scientist at, o, at the GMGI, and he oversees the fisheries and aquaculture team, as I was just uh, relating to. So his research interests uh, originate from a passion to preserve the value of our fisheries by cutting edge uh, science and helping better understand and protect fish populations at the same time, right? We have sort of a window of opportunity here where we think there's still a lot of research that can be done. So uh, with his team, he uses advanced molecular techniques. You'll hear all about what that means, DNA-related stuff, uh, genomics, right? Gloucester Marine Genomics. He'll tell us a little bit about what that means. I imagine, I don't know. Uh, and uh, so wants to study things like, you know, stock structure, genetic, genetic diversity, effective population size, et cetera. So Tim, to give you a little bit of history on him, comes to the MGI from Charleston, uh, South Carolina, where he worked at the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. And you can see now I'm reading because I actually don't have all these facts uh, memorized. And he was a wildlife biologist concentrating on population genetics in a variety of marine fish species. He earned his Master of Science in Marine Biology at the College of Charleston, but his real interest in molecular biology and the marine environment was picked during his undergraduate studies at Penn State, where he earned, uh, he earned sorry, his Bachelor of Science. So um, before I turn over to Tim, I was asked to do one more thing, please, is to ask you to hold the questions until the end. There will be plenty of time for a Q&A, but I think it's probably easier. And also in terms of, remember, we're not alone. That's why I have these two microphones. 16, 1623 is broadcasting this live or at least recording, I don't know. And so it's probably easier technically and for all kinds of reasons to hold your question if you could until, until the end of uh, Tim's talk. So Tim, um, your turn. <laughs> I should have put, uh, yeah, that was bad. My, there's a slide about Tim that I should have put in there with all the info. So Tim is going to show you a slide <laughs> about himself. <laughs> okay, anyway, thank you. Okay. All right, well, I guess that's me. Uh, that's the slide that Mark skipped over. But uh, 
thank you so much, Mark. Um, does everyone hear me okay? Yeah. All right, thank you. So <clears throat> today we're going to talk about sustainable fisheries and sort of a buzzword or a buzz phrase, I think. And it can mean a lot of different things, but for me, it really means the, the main title of my talk. It's fish for the future. And so really what I think it, it's focusing on what we can do today to responsibly harvest our fisheries resources so that our children and our grandchildren and all the future generations can also have the privilege of having access to the bounty of the ocean. And so what I'm going to go through today is kind of what we do on the fisheries team at GMGI to help contribute to that and maybe some other small ways that we can all contribute to that. So <clears throat> the first thing I really want to touch on is just this concept of, of generally from, from like a 10,000 foot view how this works the concept of fishery science and fisheries management. So a lot of um, entities can go out and, st and study fishery science, like GMGI or federal or state agencies or universities or other nonprofits. And they collect data on what's happening with our local fisheries, usually by standardized surveys or analyzing classic biology like age and growth or reproduction of our fish populations. But often, sometimes, a lot of these um, fish stocks are extremely complex. And there might be a, a difficult area or habitat to sample or a difficult species that's really hard to study, which can create some of these data gaps. And so what I kind of set out to do for, my for the research program at GMGI is to mine the, ga mine the data gap. But beyond just mine the data gap, we want to find the data gap. And so where are these areas where we can contribute with what we bring to the table to maybe bridge that data gap? And so as a genomics institute and what we study, we study DNA. And so in a lot of these um, cases, we can bridge that gap with DNA and really fill in some of these holes that might be areas that we can contribute new and interesting data to help understand our fisheries. Because if we understand them better, that's going to make our assessments, assessments more ac accurate and then improve our fisheries management, which will make the fisheries more sustainable. So that's sort of like the whole premise beyond, behind what we do and how we think we can best contribute. So the way we really do that on the fisheries program is <clears throat> in three different ways. We kind of have three different buckets for our research. Um, the first is population genetics. So population genetics is pretty simply taking a species and looking at changes in, in the genome over time or over geographic space. So the way this relates to fisheries in a lot of ways is understanding stock structure. So it, collecting organisms for a variety of areas, seeing how they relate to each other, and that'll help you develop where your stock boundaries are before you start your, the stock assessment process. Because if that's not lined up with the bi biologically Bio biological reality, you can often get biased stock assessments. <clears throat> and if your um, assessment is not in, in line with the biology, then you can have all sorts of consequences like overfishing locally adapted populations or not harvesting at the maximum sustainable yield. So that's one way we like to contribute. <clears throat> Another is by using environmental or eDNA. This is a really big area of research for us. I'm going to go in a lot more detail about what it is and how we apply it. And then the last bucket is innovative tool development. So these are things uh, kind of pushing the technology forward, using our molecular and genomics techniques to add new tools to our toolkit as fishery scientists and fishery stock assessment biologists that don't exist right now. So it's finding that data cap. Can we create something that a tool you can use to help fill that. So I'm kind of going to walk you through a, a, a smattering of our different projects that go across all these different areas um, with the intent to give you an idea of what we're doing right now, and what we're going to be doing in the near future, and then what we might be doing in a, a, a little bit more distant future. And it's all related to how can we make our fisheries more sustainable. <clears throat> so I'm going to start off with Atlantic cod. So Atlantic cod is like this super popular fishery around here, um, super historic. 
And this, po this project is sort of a combination of population genetics and tool development at the same time. Um, so surely you've, you've heard of codfish. Um, this picture is on the banks of Gloucester drying cod that dates back to about 1900. Um, in Boston, in our state house, we have this wooden carved cod, they call the sacred cod, that was hung in 1784. So we've been fishing for cod in this region for thousands of years. But if we look more recently, in the Gulf of Maine, um, we can see that this is the, the, the uh, catch in metric tons of Atlantic cod of, from about the, the 80s into the present, and you can see it has declined quite a bit. And there's many different reasons why that might be the case. Um, but one of the realities that, that we're discovering right now is that it might be because cod populations in our region are extremely complex. So this figure was, was put together by some NOAA Fisheries um, uh, led committee that was a, a bunch of different advisory groups that contributed data on genetics. Um, life history, biology, fishermen's knowledge to, to draw out what is the population structure of Atlantic cod in our region. And so they found that there's five different stocks in, in our New England area, in, in the U.S. waters. Um, but, the, but for the vast majority of them, you can go out and you can collect a cod here at George's Bank, and that's a George's Bank cod. Or you can collect a cod in southern New England, and that's a southern New England cod. But the most complex area is right here in the western Gulf of Maine, right where we are in Gloucester. So what's happening there, as you can see from the stripes, is that there are actually two different populations that occur in the same space. <coughs> so um, what's, what those are separated by are the time in which they spawn. So we have spring spawners and we have winter spawners in the western Gulf of Maine. And this stock structure working group has identified these as two different spawning groups, and that's been backed up by genetic information. But the issue is that you can go out in the western Gulf of Maine and collect a cod, and it, once it gets to a certain size, it's really difficult to tell whether it's a spring or winter spawner. So that's a data gap, right? So what we did is we worked with the um, Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries and collected about 200 cod in the western Gulf of Maine in known spawning conditions, so we could say whether they were spring or winter um, spawned fish. We sequenced the genome of those 200 individuals and then looked across the entire genome and found about 2 million different sites along the genome where there was some amount of variation that we could compare all of the spring spawners and all of the winter spawners. We boiled all of that variation down with an analysis called a principal components analysis into two analyses, two, two axes. So on this plot here, you can see um, spring fish represented by orange dots and winter fish, fish represented by the purple dots. And when we looked across the entire genome at all those three million sites, we didn't see much differentiation. If we were to see nice, strong population structure here, we would see those colors um, grouping into different areas. But what we ended up getting is sort of this large mishmash of these colors. And so we started to think, well, why, why is that? So we looked more closely at um, those different areas along the entire genome. <clears throat> and so now, each of these dots represents one of those sites along the genome. So there's three million points on this plot. And on the x-axis along the bottom there, that's the different chromosomes that a cod have. So there's one through 23. And on the y-axis is the amount of genetic differentiation between spring and winter caught spawn, spawning cod. So what you'll see is overall, most of that genetic differentiation is very low, but there's certain areas of the genome where we see really heightened differentiation, and that's what's driving that dif the difference between spring and winter spawned fish. So we did some analyses, we did some machine learning techniques to try and figure out what, what's the least number of of these spots on the genome that we can look at and reliably tell the difference between spring and winter fish. Because when we look at them all together, that pattern doesn't really come out. And what we found is we could narrow that down to 25 spots along the genome. So again, on the left is with using those 3 million spots. And then looking at just 25 locations along the genome, we can see 
a pretty nice separation between spring and winter spawned fish with about 90% accuracy. So now what we can do is we can take a small piece of fin clip from, from a cod, bring it into the lab, and then we can tell you whether it's a spring fish or a winter fish. And that will really help the stock assessment biologists if that's the route they want to go and, and assess cod. Now we have this tool that we've provided. They, they can tell spring and winter fish apart, which was not available previously. So now I'm going to talk about a, much, a similar project, but a different critter. Um, on the top right corner, I'm going to have the picture of the, the fish I'm talking about. So if you kind of nod off during the talk and someone jabs you in, in the ribs and you wake up, you'll at least know which, which critter I'm talking about. So we're moving on to Jonah crab here. So Jonah crab are sort of quite different, whereas if cod are sort of the old hat, Jonah crab are like the new kid on the block in terms of the fisheries here. Um, <clears throat> it was tra it's traditionally been considered bycatch in the lobster fishery, but more recently, um, landings in the value of Jonah crab have really taken off in the past two decades. Um, that's what this plot is showing here. But because they're such a more recent new fishery, we don't have a lot of biology about them. We don't tend to study things that don't have a lot of commercial or recreational value. But now Jonah crab so rapidly all of a sudden has this high commercial value. So it's a bit of a scramble to start studying and understanding the biology of Jonah crab. So they're conducting the very first stock assessment for this year in U.S. waters for Jonah crab. And we've been talking to the stock assessment biologists on the Jonah crab technical committee of the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission about conduct conducting a similar population genetic structure view like we did with cod for Jonah crab. And so this is, this is a great opportunity for us to sort of get in on the ground floor with this fishery that's just kind of getting started. This is the very first stock assessment they've done. Let's draw biologically accurate stock boundaries using a very cutting edge molecular technique right from the get-go rather than doing it after studying cod for hundreds of years. So that's what we did. So we collected <clears throat> about 500 Jonah crab throughout the whole region, ranging as far north as Nova Scotia down into New Jersey waters. And we did that same exact analysis that we talked about, where we sequenced their entire genome, and we found about 5 million points on the genome where we could compare them again. We did the same thing where we boiled it down into our two axes. And this time, we started to see some interesting spatial groupings, even when we looked at all 5 million loci across the whole genome. Um, to make this a little more simpler for you, so again, each of these individual points represents an individual Jonah crab, and the colors correspond to the map you see on the left. Um, so kind of at first glance, it, it looks a little messy, but if I take away the points and, and just leave those ellipses, you can see that this sort of peach color, that's, that's the Nova Scotia sample that sort of falls out on its own in this area. We have all of these sort of blues and greens are New England, and then this purple and pink are the two New Jersey um, sites. So what we ended up seeing is, is a pattern that kind of can be summarized like this, where we have three different groups of Jonah crab along our coast, one in Canadian waters in Nova Scotia, one that occupies about all of New England, and then <clears throat> one that occupies the mid-Atlantic off the coast of New Jersey. Now this is really important because we're communicating these results as we're getting them in real time to the stock assessment biologists that are going to be conducting this. So we're getting biological unit, units that they will then be folding in into their existing data set and incorporating that and taking that into consider when they go to do the stock assessment. Bio, um, the stock assessment. So these things are, are, this is happening at a really good time for Jonah Crab, and it, it's great that our data is going to be in, incorporated into what they're doing. So now I'm going to sort of pivot away with what we're doing with population genetics and talk about environmental DNA. So <clears throat> environmental DNA, or eDNA, is genetic material that's collected from an environmental sample without ever directly sampling the organism. So what does that mean? So that means if the, you take this school of tuna that's swimming around just through their natural processes of um, breathing, swimming, eating, peeing, and pooping, they're going to naturally slough off cells and DNA into the surrounding water column. 
Long after those tuna leave, we can take advantage of that by sampling that water and then examining the DNA that's left behind to get an idea of what's going on with the biology of the water in terms of the organisms that are living there. So the way we do this is we go out and we collect a water sample. As you can see, it's fairly low tech at this part of the, the sampling process. We take it back to the lab, we filter it with a vacuum pump, and then once that water has passed through that filter, then you're left with all the DNA that was in that water column on, on your filter. So we take that in the lab, we extract the DNA off the water column, off the filter, and then there's sort of two steps you can do with it afterwards until, in terms of how we process the data. The first is called metabarcoding. Um, I kind of refer to this as like, this is the whole guest list for the party. So basically what you're getting here in our case, because we're mostly interested in fish, is give me a list of all the fish species that are present in that water column, or at least whose DNA is present in that um, water sample that we took. The other one is uh, qPCR, or quantitative polymerase chain reaction. So this is more of a, a species-specific um, approach. So this is kind of like, is the VIP in the house? So this is when you care about one particular fish species and only that one. Um, the reason we can do this is because um, it's often a little bit cheaper than the metabarcoding and it can be a little more sensitive. So I'm going to talk to you now about a couple of our projects and what we use eDNA for at GMGI. So the first is one of the species-specific approaches, and it concerns winter flounder. So winter flounder is a really important recreational and commercial fishery in Massachusetts. And these fish primarily live offshore, but then they come into our coastal embayments in the um, winter and springtime to spawn and deposit their eggs on the, on the bottom of these coastal embayments. But what is also happening very often in, in some of these inshore areas are dredging projects. Because they are navigational waterways, there's a lot of boat traffic. Um, and what those dredging projects can do is stir up a lot of sediment and increase the turbidity in these areas. That turbidity can bury the uh, eggs that are on the bottom of winter flounder and starve them of, of oxygen and lead to death. So in order to protect winter flounder, the state has put in what they call these time of year restrictions for dredging projects that are really pretty conservative because we don't have a really fine scale understanding of where and when winter flounder are throughout these systems. Sometimes it's really difficult to, to sample in some of these small, shallow embayments with some of your traditional fisheries gear. So we teamed up with the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries again, and now we're working in Cape Cod. So we have three locations on the north side of the Cape and three embayments on the south side of the Cape. And we went out and, and they handled all of the sample collection and filtration. And they did that at 10 to 13 sites in each of these embayments, and we handled all everything on the lab end. And they did this for an entire year, every month. So we could really learn where and when are these winter flounder and how can we best protect them while allowing these really important dredging activities to happen at the same time. So I'm going to walk you through um, some of our results. I can't show them all because of time constraints. Um, <clears throat> but this is, gives you an idea. This plot is based on traditional fisheries um, science metrics. So we have um, these data were uh, collected by some of our collaborators in Rhode Island across several different southern New England uh, estuaries. So um, it shows. Uh, the relative abundance of when we think uh, adults are in, in these systems, measured by fike nets, and then the same thing for young of year, which are measured by beach seines. So these are, these are the young of year that, that show up right after the adults come in, peaks around January and February, they spawn, and then the young of year grow up into a, a, a peak in July, and then slowly decline as they go through the gauntlet of being a small fish in a large area. What you'll see here is this window that I've outlined generally from January through July. Of the, those are the time of year restrictions. So you can see it's really broad. It's about half the year because our biologists are being conservative because they don't know exactly when and where winter flounder are. So now I'm going to walk you through each month of what our eDNA results look like. So uh, just walk you through these plots. On the right side for, for every month, 
These are in, I'm gonna, this example is Sesuit Harbor. There's 10 different sites here. What we did is we processed water at each of those sites and did our qPCR reaction looking for winter flounder. And so when we do that, we don't just do it once, we do it six times. So we have six different replicates for that. Basically because when we're working with environmental DNA, it's in such small quantities that we want to do it many times because we're often at the limit of what we can detect. And so what I'm going to display here is the percentage of those replicates out of six that showed up as positive for winter flounder. And so you can sort of think as, of the scale as the amount of winter flounder DNA that we detected in each of those samples, with the blue or cooler colors being zero or very little, and the warmer colors being a lot of eDNA. So we're going to kind of work through the year. I started at December, which is kind of weird, but that's like the start of winter, and that's when we start to think about winter flounder showing up, right? So, so in December, um, we can see when the biomass is very low, we find very little eDNA um, throughout, throughout Sesquit Harbor. As we move into January and February, the numbers are still pretty low, even though those traditional metrics in southern New England seem to show that that's when they should be peaking. It's in, only in March when we really start to see the environmental DNA really pick up here in Sesquit Harbor, and it remains pretty high for the rest of the year. So as we move in through April and May, there's still a lot of those warm colors, a lot of DNA in the system. And then this is what we're perceiving as the, the increase in the young of year that are happening, those young fish that were just spawned. And that stays fairly high until just about the end of the year where we kind of see signs of that gauntlet showing up and the young of year start to decrease. Um, just to give you a, a, a different perspective, this is Wakoit Bay results. I'll be showing basically set up in the exact same way. This is on the south side of the Cape now. Again, starting in December, very low, um, very low winter flounder DNA throughout the area. In January, we start to get to see some more detections. Really kind of takes off in February and March. But in this case, as soon as April comes, it seems like they're gone. And then we start to see that slow build of those young of year, what we're perceiving as the young of year, corresponding with an increase in the amount of environmental DNA we're, we're finding. And so that, that sort of peaks in July, and then again, really decreases on, throughout those fall months. And so if we look at these things all together, we can kind of see, again, those, these are those traditional plots with the, with the blue indicating what we found in, in uh, adults from fike nets and the gray for young of year and the orange are the number of sites in each of those months that we found environmental dna from winter flounder and you can see in Sesquit harbor the patterns don't really match up but in wakoit bay they do a decent job they might be off by a month here or there but the patterns are very similar but what we're really finding from this whole project is that each of these embayments seem to kind of follow their own pattern and tell their own story. So it might be the case that having super broad regulations might not be a sort of like a one size fits all situation. You might, we have to continue to do more da um, data analysis, kind of find out what's driving these patterns, whether it's temperature or or sediment or habitat or other environmental parameters. And that'll really help us hone in on what drives where and when winter flounder are to help inform these regulations for when dredging can happen. So now I'm gonna uh, touch on a little bit about, uh, uh, very briefly on a meta barcoding project. So again, this is rather than doing a single species, we're gonna look at the whole community. And I just talked way too long about Cape Cod. Let's talk about Cape Ann, right? So we're here in Gloucester right now. We're probably about here or so. And then this is the Anasquam River. Um, right in our own backyard is where we wanted to conduct this research. And the reason we're interested in this is that some of these um, shallow inshore areas are very hard to sample with large gear. So the state uses this research vessel to go and conduct trawls off our coast, but there's no way they could pull a trawl net through the Anasquam River. You know, there's so, so much boating traffic. But what we can do fairly easily is go out and dip and take a water sample. So that's what we did because I didn't really find any good um, data on 
uh, the fish community in the Anasquam River. It just doesn't really exist out there. We generally know what fish are there, but nothing's really been documented. So we, we did that, and there's so much data that came out of this. I'm only going to show you a few smatterings, but we found 65 different fish species, everything ranging from, you know, kind of the bottom of the fish food chain, things like momachugs and silver sides, all the way up through top predators and endangered species like sturgeon. Um, but one of the really cool things that I found since we sampled every month throughout the year are some really interesting seasonal patterns. So menhaden are such an important forage fish, and we know that we, they come up into our waters in, in the spring and stay, kind of hang out through the fall. And we saw really clear evidence of that using our environmental DNA. Um, what else loves to eat menhaden is striped bass. And so striped bass show this very similar seasonal pattern where they're showing up in May and then they're gone by October and we don't get them any other time. Um, a couple other examples that, that were uh, interesting for important recreational fisheries are bluefish that only come in when the water's the warmest and something like a tatog that comes in to spawn in the inshore waters. <clears throat> so this is kind of just the start of what we can do with eDNA metabarcoding. What we've really been doing recently is incorporating eDNA sampling into uh, the other surveys that the Division of Marine Fisheries has. Right now, we're sort of filling this data gap of this is an area where DMF can't go because their gear can't get into the shallow area. But really, what we're moving forward with is are there patterns that we can uncover by using environmental DNA sampling associated with other surveys that maybe they're not sampling a fish particularly well because it's too small for their net size, or there's a fish that's a little net shy and they just don't sample it well. Those are areas where we can fill in the gaps, and that's really what we're starting to do this year. So moving on again, this is our last kind of bucket, is the innovative tool development bucket. And so this is one example that we're going to be starting up this summer. And I want to take you back to the concept of you know, feeding in fishery science and, and getting fisheries management and getting the regulations. One, one of the things we already talked about with this is, is getting the stock structure right in terms of the spatial area. But another really important data point for fish stock assessments is knowing the age of fish. Uh, the age of fish is really important because it allows you to um, calculate super important population rates like mortality and recruitment. And it allows you to use catch at age models, which are the most advanced and the most accurate. And so right now, when um, NOAA conducts a stock assessment and they want to age a fish, they remove what's called the otoliths or the ear stones from the fish. So these are calcium carbonate structures that are in the, the head cavity of a fish. And as you can imagine, you have to sacrifice that animal to get those out. You take a small section and then you look at it a mic under a microscope, and that's what this image is here. And you can count the rings just like you would count the rings on a tree to know the age of that fish. But that's a really good technique for the vast majority of fish. Um, it's, it's accurate, it's available, but there's examples out there like sharks and rays. Those are made of cartilage. They don't have bony structures. They don't have otoliths, so you can't do that. Um, things like very long-lived fish, fish that are living for multiple decades, when they stop growing near the end of their life, those rings get really close together, and it can lead to inaccuracies in stock assessments. So one thing that we're proposing is to use this idea of using epigenetics to help age fish. So if you don't know what epigenetics are, it's any small change that can happen to your genome without changing the actual sequence. So over time, um, one of the most popular um, epigenetic things that we measure is called DNA methylation. So a methyl group is just a molecule that can be added on to your genome and it can help regulate gene expression. And what uh, researchers have found mostly in the human medical field is that over time, that DNA methylation can age. So right here we have this boy, and as he ages into a man and ages into a, uh, let's call him a more seasoned man, um, you see the rate of um, DNA methylation change over time. 
So we can look at specific sites in the genome and get a really good epigenetic age, basically forming a clock with this. So we're planning on uh, doing a collaborative project with NOAA this upcoming year where we're first focusing on haddock and then applying that to a universal fish tool, aging tool, that then we can start to use that on some of these fish species that don't have otoliths or that are very old or don't put down annual marks in a regular way. So that's just one other way that we're, we're trying to contribute to the accuracy of fish stock assessments. So that's kind of what we're doing right now and some of the things that we have in the very near future. I'm just gonna very quickly talk about, since we're talking about fish for the future, let's talk about some things that we hope to do and some of the technology that's kind of right on the cutting edge right now. So we talked about metabarcoding with eDNA. That's kind of the guest list for the party, right? And I get asked this question all the time when I talk about environmental DNA is, well, you can tell me who's there, but can you tell me how many are there? Um, and so we're kind of, we're getting close to it. Um, when, when I started at GMGI four years ago, and when people ask me, can we do this? I kind of said, no, we're, we're not there yet. Now, four years later, I'm saying, maybe. <laughs> we're getting better at it, right? And it's only going to continue to develop. So just to illustrate this, this is some work that's been happening on the West Coast. The x-axis here is basically your fish counts from your survey. On the, on the y-axis is the number of sequence reads you get back. And that dashed line is like a perfect correlation. Obviously, you can see it's nowhere close to there, just kind of because of some of the molecular machinery that goes from taking your sample and then all the way to the process of getting your sequences back, things get um, sort of transformed in that process. Um, in starting to look at some of that molecular machinery, this group has um, kind of made some adjustments and gotten very much improved correlations. So I don't know if we're there yet, but we're getting very close to being able to you know, dip a water sample, analyze it, and then get an idea of actually counting the number of fish that were in that original water sample. One more example I'll, I'll tell you about is called close kin mark recapture. And so it, in order to understand close kin mark recapture, you first have to understand a classic ecological process called mark release recapture. And so the way that works is if you go out and we sample five fish and we tag them, and they're represented by these red fish here, you release them out into the population, <clears throat> let them intermingle, and then go back a week later and sample again. If you have a relatively small number of tagged fish in your sample, that indicates that you have a larger population. But if we were to redo this on a smaller population, you tag your same five fish, you release them, you go back a week later, and you sample again, you can see that a lot more of those are tagged fish. So you do some pretty basic math based on how many you tagged, how many you got back, and how many were tagged and not tagged fish. And that gives you an idea of what the census size of the population is. We can take that same structure and, and use some genetics to, to kind of flip it on its head a little bit. And this is what we call close kin mark recapture. And so it's the same sort of idea but in this instance, we're, we're sampling a bunch of juveniles, which are indicated by the small fish here, and adults throughout the population. We can genotype those and then see and try to find related individuals. By doing that, these fish effectively mark each other. And it's, so if you think of the same kind of structure as what we have with our mark release recapture, if you find a lot of related individuals, that means your population is smaller, but if you find very few related individuals, it's much larger. And this has been done a few times in, in the fish literature, and they found really nice correlations and really nice estimates of sample size. So now we're, we're talking about actually getting true sample size numbers just from fish tissues um, that we sequence. <clears throat> so that's sort of an exciting aspect of, of where we're headed and, and what's on the horizon. And, so I think with all of this, I, I think that the future of fisheries is bright. You sort of hear a lot of doom and gloom talk about our fish stocks and, and declining numbers and unsustainable fishing. But I think with the tools that we have available to us, there's a lot of room 
to make our fisheries sustainable. That's not without saying that it won't take work, okay? It will absolutely take work, and it it's kind of takes work from everyone, right? So it means scientists like GMGI and other stock assessment biologists really pushing forward with the technology that we have. It means the regulators being willing to incorporate new data sources into their assessment and into their management strategies. Um, industry members being flexible and understanding that regulations are going to change. And then consumers, you have a lot of power to kind of drive the market and, and ask for sustainable options. Um, so I, th I think the last point that I wanna make is that while it takes work from all of us, we can't be siloed in our own sectors. We need to have open communication and th this is like one of the first parts of that, right? So you just heard all about what GMGI Fisheries does on a regular basis, the tools that we have available. If you're in the industry and you've identified a data gap, let's talk about it. Let's see if we can fill that data gap with the tools that we have available. Now you know what we're all about. Um, <clears throat> so if you want to talk about it, my email's up on this page, and I also have some cards out on the registration tables. But I'd really like to highlight my team here, um, uh, Dylan Combe and Carly McCall, they did the vast majority of the work that I presented on and made the projects happen. Um, and I just wanna give them a quick plug. In about two weeks, they're gonna be talking in a little more detail about two of the projects I talked about tonight, Jonah Crab and Winter Flounder. So that's next Tuesday uh, in Ipswich. You can register for that online. Um, and so with that, I'd also like to thank all of our funders, including all of the donors that are here tonight and the incredible, incredible support we've gotten from the state. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for your attention and I'd be happy to take any questions. What do you think? I still remember it 10 years ago, s sitting here for things sort of related to where we are and, and reading that sentence, build not for today alone, but for tomorrow as well. So this idea of using DNA technology was um, very much influenced by that as well. Um, what we had no idea, at least the co-founders and the people involved in the mi in, at the beginning who actually are doing nothing, uh, because you're doing all the work with your team, was that, you know, was that gonna work with, with water? I mean, like, you know, we know that environmental DNA can be used to, you know, innocent somebody from, from uh, and take them out of death row because, because their DNA was never at the crime scene. So we, we sort of knew that, but anyway, so you guys did an amazing job. Um, questions? Uh, do you wanna start? Uh, yes, and, and the, the deal is, I'm supposed, since you don't have a microphone, and again, that people can't hear you here, and also, I'll repeat the questions. Yes? So what's the value of knowing the difference between green and spring? Oh, that's a good one. So what's the value of differentiating between spring and winter on a particular uh, species? So the, the main value is that since those are <coughs> independent populations, Assessing them all as one, you have the chance to over-harvest one or the other, and then you're losing that local diversity fr from that. And you're also assessing them together versus assessing them separate. You can bias your stock assessment because you really have two populations and you're treating them as one. And so your regulations won't be in line with the biological reality. So you could be over-harvested or under-harvesting that stock, both of those stocks that way. I mean, there are many other things you, people have looked at. Uh, migration distances, for example. I remember the tuna example. It's, it's if you don't put that into your models, things can go very wrong rapidly in terms of assessing what, um, what, what the stocks are. This is another beautiful example of that. Was that, was that clear? All right, another question. Yes. I, 
I didn't get the word. Wait, how do you factor what? He said, I, I can answer on Why this don't one you so, uh, repeat the question? So the question was, how do you factor currents into your ah. eDNA sampling? It's a great question. Um, you kind of have to do your best a little bit. Uh, so like Winter Flounder, for example, or the Anasquam River, we're sampling in all those locations at low tide. So if you think about an estuary, at low is going to be when all the water is sort of pushing out. And so that's going to really highlight your chances of getting water that's endemic to your area that you're sampling. So there's a couple of strategies that we use. DNA lasts in the water for 24 to 48 hours. So in some regions, it can really travel far away, and, and folks have studied that. Um, so it's just it's sort of something that you have to keep in the back of your mind when you're designing an eDNA study is to account for the fact that there can be transport. And like one example that I didn't put up there is, is we found yellow perch in, in the Anasquam River. It's very much a freshwater fish. But we found it in March when, and when yellow perch are spawning. And so they're putting all of their gametes, all their DNA out in the water in this one big pulse. And then currents are carrying it. And it's degrading over time, but it can still get to our sample. So you have to be really, import, uh, really critical and careful of how you're analyzing your results. I don't think there's yellow perch in the Anasquam River, but we could piece together a pretty uh, parsimonious answer that says, oh, th they're spawning at this time. That's the only time we find them. That's what's happening. Great. Another question. Yes, please. Yeah, it's kind of the same same sort of question than than winter and and um, the seasonal differences. So, but Riz is asking, you know, why why identifying these different species? How can that help you really in terms of assessment? Yeah, it's a great question. But. Yeah. So in reality, there's so many different factors that go into how you're actually going to assess a population, right? That's like strictly what the biology says. And, and that stock structure working group actually had really nice agreement between all of their methods that they used, being genetics or tagging or life history. But we live in a place called reality. And so sometimes assessing a, a, a stock with five different populations, or maybe you make it three, it sort of depends on what the model says, what the fishing regulations are, like how the fishing is concentrated. The, the benefit to bringing it into that many is that you're in line with biology, which will then make your assessment more accurate. The, the cost is that if you break cod into the five different stock structure, you might not have enough data to really be robust in one of those small areas, like the spring or the winter or southern New England. So it's a little bit of a cost-benefit analysis um, in that way. But it's good to start from the bio biology reality and then sort of work your way from there. Great answer. Yes, please. Did you find any surprise in the uh, Anisquam species list? You sort of mentioned. Yeah, so yellow perch was certainly one of them. There was a, a, a handful of other freshwater species that sort of had similar stories. Um, one thing is, so like uh, our, um, uh, one of our sites is at the mile marker, right? And so you also need to consider these types of things. We were sort of we were landlocked, right? We weren't sampling in boats, so we were sampling at marinas and things. And you have to uh, think about all the potential sources. So I can tell you we got a lot of tuna right at the, land, the mile marker. I like, do I think tuna are swimming around the Anasquam? No, but I, I, are they prepping a lot of tuna dishes at the mile marker? Yes, they are. So it's thinking about things like that. So like, there was a couple other examples of fish that we typically think of, of offshore monkfish and Acadian redfish that I think are discards from people's plates that are ending up there. Um, there there's another interesting example of, of sand lance. There's, there's a Pacific species, and there's a couple of Atlantic species. But we kept finding this match to this Pacific species. And 
And that really, the issue there that, that I really dug into to try and find out is it's actually an issue with a reference database. So when you do this work, you, you, do, you um, sequence your strand of DNA, and then you have to match it to something to find out what it is. So that was a mistake in the reference database. And I actually saw it throughout the literature many times in the Atlantic of people saying the specific sand lance was, was detected in Atl Atlantic waters. But people really weren't doing their homework. And, and sometimes I can understand why is because when you get a list of 60 some species, you really have to do your homework on each one of them and evaluate it critically. Anything else? Uh, one more question over there. Yes, please go ahead. <clears throat> Oh. So maybe I can I can say just so do we have a sequencing instrument um, in the institute is is the question maybe maybe you should take it first and I'll, I'll, I might make a comment go ahead okay. all right I'll see if I can do my best um, yes we do so we have um, we we have three different sequencers in house um, so that's um, and I'll, I'll let Mark comment on what he's going to comment, but it, it's, it's actually no, go ahead, go ahead. a really beneficial thing, I think, for all of our staff, because that's kind of a rare thing. E even some of these larger universities don't have access to this. So we can train our staff on the whole process from, from taking the water sample, filtering it, extracting the DNA, and then actually sequencing it in-house, where most other people that work in the labs like ours have to send that out. And so they don't get to see that last process, part of the process. And so I think it's a really valuable training tool. And we have an amazing opportunity to have access to the sequencers that we do. Yeah, so, so perfect. I'll add to that that a friend of mine calculated that um, the cost of DNA sequencing has decreased so much every year since 2000, let, let's put it this way. Uh, that uh, if you had bought a Porsche, for example, for whatever the price of a Porsche was in 2000, uh, you would buy it today for about a dollar. I, I think that's, or $10, I forgot. But you can see that it's many, many orders of magnitude. And there were a bunch of things that were uh, involved, of course, that, that sort of got into, converged all at the same time for that amazing decrease in cost. But one, one key one was developed by one of the co-founders of, of GMDI. His name is David Wald and uh, through the, uh, a company called Illumina. And so, of course, there's constantly, you know, I mean, we, we kind of think DNA and sequencing, and that's why genomics came into the, the name of the, of the institute to begin with. Yeah, so, but I mean, his answer is perfect. But um, this, it's, and that really is also still to this day at that scale. We're small, right? No doubt if you compare us to, uh, you know, um, uh, Woods Hole or places like that. I mean, there's, there's plenty of marine, beautiful marine biology uh, institutions. Uh, you know, Nahant is one of them, I mean, Bigelow's, whatever. Um, but that angle of, of, you know, looking forward and using DNA uh, technology to solve problems out there, uh, we're still kind of sort of unique uh, in that, in that um, window of opportunities. Anyway, oh yeah, <laughs> more qu more questions. Yes, ha, Tom, how you doing? So, can, yes. so the question is, with the changes, would they be climate related or, or otherwise? Are these equations of different subspecies, for example, changing over time, right? And is that, is that important? Yeah. So in order to detect the, the level of differentiation that they are seeing, it's not super strong. But even weak differ differentiation like that has to be set up by thousands of years. So. The idea is that, yes, the, the, what's hard-coded in, in the DNA has been, that's been established for a while.
but they have found some really so interesting um, research has been done on cod, and, and, and so some of the, 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 that, that plot I showed that shows these really interesting areas of differentiation, they've identified those at many points throughout the cod genome, and what they are is chromosomal inversions where half of the chromosome flips, um, and those things end up persisting into these different what they call ecotypes, so you can have fish that really like to stay coastally or ones that like to move around a lot more. And they find these really interesting differentiations based on that flip. So th that flip happened sometime in evolutionary history, but then it's been persisted through these interesting ecotypes. All right. Um, I, it's it's uh, a little late. Uh, I think we should, we should let you go home and have dinner if you haven't had dinner or whatever. I just want to say just one more sentence about this. You, I hope you can see that I was on the right track telling you about the human capital that we have. Um, the science is great and everything else. The building is beautiful, but this type of people is really what, what makes the institution. <clears throat> and, and the second thing, we can thank every single one of them one at a time for a lot of things you've done. Uh, but, you know, you've all contributed to different extent. But today, you could have watched TV or, I don't know, watched 1623, and then you would have seen us anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but we really appreciate you for all the help and all the, the uh, support and for being here tonight. So thank you so much. Thank you.